Over the last two weeks, we have practiced remembering, releasing, and reimagining. This week, we conclude our stewardship series by focusing on restoration. Restoration is a mending, a healing, a setting back on the right path that creates the ability to live into the fruit of forgiveness and reconciliation. I don't know how often we think about restoration or the word restoration. If you sit with the word, perhaps what comes to mind is Habitat for Humanity's secondhand store called The Restore, a play on words where our used home furnishings can go back to a store to be resold or restored to give new life to a new house. Maybe the word reminds you of the aftermath of the Civil War, our divided country seeking restoration and wholeness. Or maybe it's a prayer for a good night's sleep in hopes that we find restoration for our bodies and our minds. Perhaps the biblical story of Jacob and Esau comes to mind. We didn't formally hear the story this morning, but it is part of our additional text for this series. The story in Genesis 33 requires a good bit of context to shed light on the comp complexities and baggage within Esau and Jacob's relationship. Jacob has just wrestled with a stranger, an angel, and now in preparation to meet his brother is likely wrestling inwardly with his feelings about his relationship to Esau, their father, and his own sense of worth. You may recall that Jacob steals Esau's birthright and disadvantages not just Esau, but the generations that are to follow. And Esau... He extends radical forgiveness to his brother, given the lengths to which he has been cheated. Jacob even sends servants and livestock ahead of him to appease his brother. And Esau, releasing him from burning resentment, says, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. The story invites us to think about the role of restoration in our lives. While salvation is not ours to attain, ultimately stewardship calls for an examination of our hearts as we investigate our own experiences, fears, desires, and passions. Ultimately, we are encouraged to go further, to work toward restoration. Restoration, like hope, doesn't just happen. To paraphrase my colleague and friend, Reverend Lisette Cross, we can't hope ourselves into right relationships. Restoration doesn't just happen, but is a conscious, courageous choice to lean into what is difficult. There are many real life stories of restoration. There's a story of Keith and Misty. On a summer evening in 1992, Keith shot Misty in an attempt to steal her car. He was arrested and convicted. But in 2001, when Misty learned that Keith was soon to be released, she was terrified that he would return to hurt her family. Her fear actually paralyzed her for another nine years until she decided to do something radical. After nearly 20 years, she reached out to Keith to begin a dialogue. And the discussion took both of them in a direction that they never expected. Through hard conversations and questions and listening, over the years, they found restoration. Misty says she is now experiencing freedom and relief after years of trauma. And the two 
even now work together, sharing their story and helping others find restorative justi justice through a program called Bridges to Life. The work of restoration is a response of grace. Yet ultimately, good stewardship practices restore healthy relationships between people and the earth and God. Lives are transformed in the giving of gifts, gifts to exchange and repair a broken world. And giving our gifts, be that money or belongings or time or how we treat the earth, we find that we are being reconciled to God. Ultimately, practicing faithful stewardship heals us as individuals and helps us restore right relationships with one another. And we see and hear this in the final chapter of John's gospel, when Jesus appears to the disciples and fills their empty fishing nets. Even after death, Jesus restores our hope and provides an abundant feast. This scripture is one of my favorite images in the Bible. And I think because it paints uh, a picture that is so robust of normalcy or an attempt at normalcy after the death of Jesus. The disciples are just trying to get back to a routine after the loss of their teacher and friend, and they do what they know best. Simon Peter says, I'm going fishing. And I imagine the other disciples not wanting to be left alone in their grief go with him. It's early morning. They don't notice Jesus on the beach. And they aren't having any luck fishing. And Jesus calls out to them, have you caught anything? And when they respond, no, he encourages them to cast their nets on the other side. And when that change works out and their nets are full, they realize who it is. And Jesus invites them to share their abundance and come and have breakfast. This three-week journey began with Jesus and his disciples around the table, remembering stories, holding out hope for the new economy to come, a new way of being, a vision for how the church might be in the neighborhood, in the world. And we end with Jesus and his disciples in virtually the same place. Disciples gathered, confused around a meal, trying to figure out a way forward. But the abundance of fish is not the point. We can't just tinker around with where we place our nets or else we will be back to the same place we started. Jesus isn't providing advice on where to catch fish. He moves into providing instruction that is embodied and tactical and physical. He gives specific, clear instructions to the disciples. Feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. Follow me. The old way does not work. The old money stories that we have told ourselves do not work. They gave us a foundation, but that foundation must be restored. It must be made new through God's economy. The choice is this. Live in the old stories or make new ones. Find ourselves in fear of the money stories that have taken hold of our lives or transform them to create them into a new economy. And the good news is that we don't do this work alone. We have the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have the gift of the church. We have the guidance. Let go of the ways that we have known 
and feed the sheep. What a blessing it is that we have the good news of a Savior that transforms lack into abundance, despair into hope, and where abandonment is replaced with a restoration of relationships. Amen.